نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به وتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي اما بعد فان اسلك الحديث كتاب الله وخير هدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلال في النار on this important occasion of it being the blessed week of ashura let us take some time to remind ourselves and reflect on some of the virtues and the lessons that we can take from this important time of the year ashura or the tenth of muharram is a important if uh, if it's an important occasion in the Islamic calendar and its importance was there from the very beginning in the early years of Islam even before the revelation of fasting the month of Ramadan there was fasting the day of Ashura this is a very early command in Islam to fast the day of Ashura later it was reduced to being a recommendation a mustahab by the early days it was an obligation and it was the habit of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he was asked what is the best fast outside of ramadan and he said the fast of muharram and when the sahaba were asked about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which month would he put the most effort into fasting outside of ramadan and he, they replied muharram so the fast of ashura was something the the fasting of which was known to be sunnah and it wasn't just the practice of the muslims but even the jews of medina used to fast ashura because it is linked to the day on which prophet musa alayhi salam was saved from the fire as for the actual rewards for fasting the day of ashura there is the hadith that is stated that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that whoever fasts the day of ashura that it is hoped that their past their sins will be forgiven so a distinction is made here between the fast of ashura and the fast of the day of arafah which was last month that on the day of arafah if you fast the previous years and the next year sins are forgiven but with ashura it is the past year sins that are forgiven so that puts arafah on a higher level nonetheless outside of arafah and ramadan ashura is the most important fast that we should take now Why is this such an important day in our history? The interesting thing about the day of Ashura is that it seems to be a day on which events keep happening. Not just before the time of revelation, but even after revelation, the important events happen on this day. And the events related to Ashura often seem to have common themes. The theme of sacrifice for the sake of Allah the theme of dealing with tyrants the theme of allah sending his divine aid these are all recurring themes on the different events that happen on ashura <coughs> one of the events that is linked to ashura according to some scholars is the end of the flood at the time of nu alayhi salam now there's difference of opinion on whether it's authentically linked to ashura or not nonetheless many scholars do link it to ashura and they say that at the time of the prophet nu alayhi salam when the flood happened that was sent as a punishment for all the disbelievers the flood ended on the day of ashura so ashura was the day when the ship touched ground and they were able to get off it and they were able to restart civilization so this event shows us that difficult occasions come to an end because the story of nu alayhi salam is a very long story of a man dealing with century upon century of difficulty he preached to his people for 950 years and after those 950 years the people still rejected him and allah had to send the flood to punish those people and it's only after that on the day of ashura that the ease came that the flood was over the enemies were gone and now they could restart civilization with the righteous 
The other event, which is more authentically linked with Ashura, and the one that's more commonly known as the event of Ashura, is the saving of Musa alayhi salam from the Pharaoh. And again, it's the same story, that a prophet of Allah spent many years doing da'wah, he had to deal with tyranny, he had to deal with these people rejecting him, and it's on the day of Ashura that Allah sent a miracle to save him and his people and to liberate them from the tyrant, and after that they were able to practice in peace. And the story of Musa alayhi salam is one that we need to reflect on a lot. It is the most repeated story in the Quran for a reason, because this is a story from which we, we can derive many lessons that apply to us today. The story of Musa alayhi salam teaches us how to do da'wah. That he was sent to speak to the greatest of tyrants. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him, Speak to him gently. Perhaps he may remember, he may gain piety. And so this becomes the principle of da'wah, that we speak to people gently. That we convey the message in a way that is understanding, compassionate, wise, that we are careful with our choice of words. You know, we live in an age where it's become cool to be rough and to be tough in how you do your da'wah. You know, to have a vulgar, harsh way of doing da'wah. And many young people think that if someone is vulgar and harsh in their da'wah, that they are, you know, the cool guys and speaking the truth, they're telling it like it is. But they don't realize the psychological effect this has on other people. That when you are always harsh and always vulgar and always rude to people, you're not going to reach their hearts. You're not going to get them to change. You're just going to push them further and further away. The sunnah of Musa alayhi salam and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was to preach the truth without any changes to, the, to what the truth is, but to do it in a way that is understanding and kind and compassionate. So you don't change the message, but you change your tone, you change your voice, you change how you present the message. That you use hikmah, you use wisdom, and you use rahmah, you use compassion to guide how you present it without changing the message itself. And it seems that for many young people this has been lost because it's, again, it's cool these days to be rude and to be harsh and to tell it like it is. But Musa alayhi salam teaches us that we should speak gently even when speaking to the tyrants. The story of Musa alayhi salam also teaches us that Allah's help comes in ways that we never imagined. Allah's help comes in ways that we never imagined. So if you look at the story of Musa and, and Fir'aun, you see for many years oppression and there doesn't seem to be any end to the oppression and it reaches a boiling point, a level of frustration where Musa and his people they get up and they start to leave and the army starts to chase them and they are now stuck between the, the, the sea and the enemy and at that point from a worldly perspective, from terms of just pure dunya, there seems to be no way out. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to Musa alayhi salam to touch the sea with his stick. The sea splits open, they go through it, and he closes on the enemies and drowns them, and that is the end. A trial that went on for years and years and years just ended in an instant through a miracle. It ended in an instant through a miracle. And that should give us hope. Because every Muslim goes through trials in their life that they feel is never ending. Every Muslim goes through trials in their life that just seems to go on and on for years. But with Allah's help and by the will of Allah, that trial can end in an instant. Something that could be causing you pain for years and years and years. If Allah wills it, all it takes is one moment and it's over. And then it becomes like it never happened. It becomes part of your past. <clears throat> After a few years, you might even forget it happened. And so we take hope from the message of Musa alayhi salam, the story of Musa alayhi salam, that miracles can happen, and that trials can end quickly, and that overnight things can turn in our favor. Another lesson we can take from the story of Musa alayhi salam is that sometimes the people who, who, who help you, the people who take your side, come from the most unexpected of places. When we look at the story of Musa alayhi salam and his da'wah to the Pharaoh, we know that the Pharaoh not only rejected the message of Musa alayhi salam, but he was a tyrant to anyone who believed in it. That he was willing to kill people for believing in Musa alayhi salam. Yet despite this, 
his own wife believed. His own wife, the wife of the Pharaoh, Athia, she believed. And not only did she believe, but she reached the greatest level of Iman that anyone can reach. The Prophet wasallam said that four women reached the level of perfection of Iman. Perfection, the highest possible level that a woman can reach in her Iman. <coughs> and those four were included his wife Khadija and his daughter Fatima, and of course the Lady Mary, Maryam alayhi salam. But the fourth one that he mentioned was the wife of the Pharaoh. The wife of the Pharaoh reached a level of perfection of faith. What do we mean by perfection of faith? She was married to the worst tyrant in the history of this world. But that didn't stop her from believing. And he tortured her and that didn't stop her from believing. And eventually he killed her and she died in Shaheed, she died in Mata. And her dua right till the end was, Oh Allah, build for me a house near you in Jannah. Her faith was unwavering. This is the perfection of faith that every man and woman should strive for. That the wife of the Fir'aun is a role model for the believers. Not a role model for women, a role model for believers. Every man, woman and child should look at her level of Iman and say, that's what I want to strive for. I want to reach a level of faith where nothing can break me. Where nothing can cause me to doubt the religion. <coughs> where nothing can cause me to leave the religion. And that is something we learn from the story of the wife of the Pharaoh. And it wasn't only the wife of the Pharaoh who believed. There were other people in his home who believed as well. We don't have the exact details. But some of the narration mentioned the lady who used to comb his daughter's hair. She became a believer. Another narration mentions one of his own cousins or siblings became a believer. Right? All the Quran simply says a believer from the home of the Pharaoh. It leaves it anonymous. But the point is, even in the worst of times, in the worst of places, in the home of the biggest of tyrants, Iman still reaches the heart of those who seek the truth. Iman still reaches the heart of those who want guidance. And that should give us hope. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what time frame you live in. It doesn't matter how bad things are. You can still be a righteous believer. In any time, in any place. If people could be righteous believers in the home of the battle, we don't have any excuse where we are today. So we said there are three events in general that are associated with the day of Ashura. Two of them we take from the narrations. So there is uh, the narrations indicating that the flood of Nu was around this time. And there is the authentic narration <coughs> that Musa salam, was saved from the Pharaoh on, on this day. A third event that is often linked to Ashura is something that happened after the time of Rasulullah in the next generation. And that is the tragedy of Karbala. And we covered this last year in more details, but just to summarize it, a generation after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, around 50 years later, there was a clash politically over the leadership of the Muslim world. And the Muslims experienced their first time ever a rule of a tyrant, a Muslim tyrant, right, by the name of Yazid. And the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hussein radiallahu anhu, he opposed Yazid. And he did not want to accept his rule because he viewed him as a tyrant. And long story short, Yazid sent an army to catch Hussein and bring him to him. And this army, they surrounded Hussein and his family on the tent of Muharram and they massacred the descendants of the Prophet wasallam. One of the biggest tragedies in the history of Islam, the Prophet wasallam's own grandchildren and great-grandchildren were massacred on the tent of Muharram by Muslims. By Muslims. And this led to a series of events. It led to riots. It led to the looting of Medina. It led to all kinds of civil wars. This was the beginning of a very dark phase in our history. Because the murder of Hussein was not something that went unrecognized. Right? This, is a, this is a wrong understanding of history. Now, some people point, point, point and say that you know they don't care about what happened to Hussein. But historically, that's not true. When Hussein was murdered, the Muslims of Medina were furious. The Muslims of Medina were furious and they began to rebel against Yazid. And Yazid sent an army who looted and raided and, and murdered the Muslims of Medina in one of the most brutal massacres in the history of, of Islam. And then the governor, or rather the leader of Makkah, also rebelled against Yazid for the same reason. 
Abdullah ibn Zubair, and he established his own Khilafat in Makkah. And for 14 years he waged war against the Umayyads. So why did people say that the Muslims didn't care about what happened? Clearly they didn't, because they went, they did not go down quietly. They fought. And what we can take from this story is that, you know, there may be different approaches in our religion and how to deal with tyrants, but at the end of the day, remember the hadith called Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdalu jihadin kalimatul haq in the sultan jaya. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the greatest form of jihad is to speak a truth in the, world, in the face of a tyrant. To speak the truth in the face of a tyrant. Why is this the greatest form of jihad? Because when you're in the battlefield and you have a sword and your enemy has a sword, you're on equal footing. Right? If you have a gun and your enemy has a gun, you're on equal footing. But if you are a scholar or a saint or even just an average person in the court of a tyrant and you speak a word of truth, you're not on equal footing. If he orders your execution, you can't fight back. If he massacres your family, you can't fight back. You are not on equal footing. So to speak the word of truth at that time, knowing it can cost you your life, knowing it can cost your family their lives, knowing that there is no way for you to defend yourself, this is jihad on its highest level. This is the greatest form of jihad. And this is what Musa alayhi salam did. This is, in a way, what Hussein did. This is really any Muslim in history who stood up against tyrants. This is what they did. That they were willing to speak a truth even if it cost them their lives. So we ask Allah to allow us to benefit from this day. It is a day in which there is a lot of reward. We ask Allah to allow us to fast these days and to gain the reward of fasting and to benefit from the role models of our history, the great martyrs of our history, the great warriors of our history, the great da'is of our history, the great prophets of our history. We ask Allah to allow us to benefit from the examples and to follow in their footsteps. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat yama yasifun wa salamu ala mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أما بعد فإن أستك الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحديث حديث محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة بدعة. There is a second virtue associated with Ashura over which there is difference of opinion. Well, I'll mention it because I I'm of the opinion that it is acceptable and authentic. And that is the hadith in which the Prophet وسلم, said, whoever spends on their family on the day, whoever spends generously on their family on the day of Ashura, Allah will take care of them, Allah will spend generously on them for the entire year. And one of the great scholars of the past, one of the great saints of the past, he commented on this hadith and said for 50 years he followed this hadith and he found it to be true. And so this is a practice, which again, I know some ulama of the view that the hadith is weak and we respect their opinion. Others are of the opinion that the hadith is acceptable and that is the opinion we follow. But based on this hadith, if we could today and tomorrow be generous in what we spend on our families, so go above and beyond, do something about the extra, you know, maybe treat them out, maybe buy some gifts, maybe give them extra allowance, maybe, you know, just do something different, something extra, something above and beyond for your families. Just this could trigger baraka in your risk for the rest of the year. Right? It can trigger baraka in your risk for the rest of the year. And so we can say there are two virtues that are associated with Ashura. The first is the fasting of Ashura. The second is being generous on the day of Ashura. And we should strive to do both. Now, going back to the concept of fasting. Fasting outside of Ramadan is something that many Muslims don't take serious. You know, we tend to only fast in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan we don't want to think about it. But what we don't realize is that fasting is a very powerful spiritual experience. It's one of the most important good deeds that you can do for yourself. When you study the history of righteous people, most of them had the habit of fasting throughout the year at different points. So Dawood alayhi salam would fast every second day. Right? He would fast every second day. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would fast so much that people would think he's not going to break his fast. When we look at the righteous people of the past, fasting was part of who they were in and out of Ramadan. It wasn't something they restricted to Ramadan. So we can start to follow in their footsteps with a few simple things. 
Something as simple as Arafah and Ashura. One day in Zul Hijrah, two days in Muharram. It's a simple start, right? If you're not accustomed to fasting outside of Ramadan, this is a simple way to get started. One day in Zul Hijrah, two days in Muharram. And then we can build upon that. You can fast Mondays and Thursdays. We can fast on the, on the three middle days of the month, right? There are other days in the year where, they, where there is recommendation to fast. But understand, the spiritual benefits of fasting are great. And there are many hadiths where the Prophet وسلم, uh, he recommended fasting simply for the spiritual benefits. So on one occasion, we saw a group of young men sitting together and talking. And these were young single men and young single men when they get together and talk. You know, men know what they talk about. And Rasulullah وسلم, advised them and he said, whoever amongst you can get married, please get married. But if you can't get married, fast. Because it helps you to control yourself. And so this is the number one spiritual benefit of fasting. It helps you to control yourself. A lot of youngsters struggle today with self-control. That we have this, we live in this world that's all about the nafs, it's all about our desires. And everything on the TV, and on the internet, and on the video games, and on the billboards, it's all just pushing your desires on you. And people's desires are out of control. And instead of controlling their desires, their desires control them. One way to turn this around, one way to regain control over your desires and to be once again, the person in control is to start fasting. Take time to fast outside of Ramadan. Start with, the, with these simple fasts of Ashura and, and uh, Zulhijjah and use it as an occasion to rebuild yourself spiritually. It is a shield between you and sin. That is another description of fasting. It is a shield between you and sin because when you are fasting, you are more in control. You are more aware of what you are saying and what you are doing. Right? You're not going to use vulgar language when you're fasting because you, you lose the reward of fasting if you use vulgar language. Right? You're not going to be looking at haram while you're fasting because then you, you lose the reward of fasting if you're looking at something haram. So, I would encourage everyone to build a habit of fasting. It shouldn't be something we restrict to Ramadan. It shouldn't be something that we only do when we have to do it. But just like we do extra zikr to boost our iman and we pray extra salah to boost our iman, do extra fasting to boost your iman as well. And you will find that this will have a profound impact on your mind, on your body, and most importantly, on your soul. We ask Allah to allow us to be from those who practice this religion as it's meant to be practiced. And we ask Allah to grant us the proper understanding of Islam. رَبَّنَا أَنْتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنًا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنًا وَقْنَا ذَبَنَّا رَبَّنَا حَبْلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَزُرِّيَاتِنَا كُرَّنْتَ أَعْيُنْ وَاجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين